Good morning and thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Melissa Yapel and welcome to our third episode of Water Bug, um, excuse me, our third episode of Wild and Scenic Rivers. And this time we're going to be talking about water bug superpowers. Um, I'm here today with my coworkers from the Scenic Rivers program, which is within our division of natural areas and preserves. Um, I have Christine Shemansky. Hopefully I said that right, Christine. <laughs> and Christine's going to be helping me with questions today. And then I have Matthew Smith. And he's also going to be helping with questions. Next week, Matthew's going to be the presenter. But this week, we have Ryan Moss, who is going to be doing this super fun um, pre presentation today. Um, he gave me a sneak peek before we started, and I promise you're going to love it. Uh, if you have any questions, though, for Ryan throughout the presentation, utilize the Q&A box. Um, I'll go ahead and say hi in there so you know where where it is. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So, Ryan. All right, am I live now? You are live. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Ryan Moss. I'm the SQM coordinator or stream quality monitoring coordinator for Northeast Ohio. Um, we're going to be covering the water bug superpowers today. Uh, we're, it's actually going to cover uh, a little bit about uh, what is an aquatic macroinvertebrate, the life history of some of the uh, invertebrates, and also the identification if you find some of these in the field, kind of touching on what Heather covered last week with, you know, looking for the bugs and where to look for them. Um, and then we're going to go over, you know, what makes some of those bugs super powered. So there's a lot of pretty cool things that some of our insects can do here in Ohio, so we'll get to those here shortly, but um, let's see here. Trying to figure, whoops. So is the PowerPoint showing up now? Yep, you, okay. it's loading right now. Okay. Good to go. All right. So this is the water bug superpowers. Um, going into what the Scenic Rivers program is, we've covered this in the past webinars, um, but we'll just touch on this real quickly. Uh, the Scenic Rivers program was created in 1968, or the Scenic River Law was passed and is the first of its kind in the nation, um, even before the federal uh, Scenic Rivers program was created. Um, the Scenic Rivers Program's mission is to protect the natural qualities of the remaining high quality streams that we have in the state of Ohio. As you can see on the left there, those are the, we have 15 designated rivers. Um, there's different types of designations we have between scenic, wild and scenic, and scenic and recreational. Um, wild is the highest quality that you can get um, in the state of Ohio. Uh, like I said, we had 15 designated rivers, over 830 miles are designated on those rivers. Um, and also in the Scenic Rivers Program is the volunteer uh, monitoring, which falls under the Stream Quality Monitoring Project. Um, that was started in 1983. Um, and the goal was to assess our river's health by looking at the aquatic macroinvertebrates. So first off, what is an aquatic macroinvertebrate? In, to understand what that is, is we have to just break down that term aquatic macroinvertebrate. So aquatic means lives in the water. Uh, macro means it's big or large enough to see with the naked eye. Now, some of the things that we're gonna see, such as like midge larva and black fly larva, they're still very tiny. So when you think big, we're not thinking like the size of a truck. You're looking at stuff that still you may need a hand lens to look at, but you can still see it with the naked eye without having to look at it under a microscope. Um, and then the invertebrate means without a backbone, um, has an exoskeleton. So going into this um, diagram here shows a difference like some of the vertebrates as opposed to invertebrates. Uh, vertebrates are mammals, your fish, amphibians, reptiles, whereas your invertebrates are your insects, your crustaceans, and your mollusks. Um, going into, okay, so this is two diagrams covering life history. 
So as you see on the left, you have the butterfly diagram there. You can see there's four parts, and that's called a complete metamorphosis, where you go from an egg to a larva or a caterpillar, then you go to a pupa, whereas the caterpillar goes into the cocoon and then emerges as a butterfly. So there's four stages to complete metamorphosis. And if you see that term larva, that's that means that it goes through a complete metamorphosis. Whereas this, the picture on the right with the dragonfly, you can see there's only three stages. There's an egg where it goes into a nymph and then it goes into the adult dragonfly. So that's a three stage and that's an incomplete metamorphosis. You don't have that pupa or that cocoon stage that you have with the complete metamorphosis. So why do we look at the macroinvertebrates? You know, we get this question at a lot of workshops and people that aren't familiar with, you know, telling water quality. They say, you know, what's so great about the bugs? You know, bugs are disgusting and we don't, and they're awful to see, but, um, one thing is, is they're very good indicators of stream health. Uh, some of the invertebrates that we see are, um, they need the highest quality water to survive. They need high dissolved oxygen. Um, so if you have polluted water, you're not going to see them. So they are very good to see in a stream and they are very good indicators of, of good water quality. Um, other reason why we look at them is it's very cost efficient to look at. You don't need the expensive lab equipment that you would need with doing chemical testing, and you would you don't need the expensive like boats and electrofishing equipment that you would need to go actually go out and do water quality by looking at the fish species. Um, I don't know if you can see over my shoulder here, this net that we have behind me. Here is uh, actually the net that we use when we go out to collect macroinvertebrates. It's just a simple three foot by three foot uh, fine mesh seine. Ryan, I just uh, put okay. you full screen, so if you could show that again. Okay, so it's actually right here. I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, yeah. It's kind of folded together, but it's just two two handles, and then it's a just a fine mesh seine. And what we do is we put it in the water, and we just allow the um, the river to wash the bugs into the net, and then we go through and identify them. So it's very cost efficient, very easy to collect the bugs. They're not very fast moving, so they're they're pretty easy to get in your net. So here's a picture of us actually collecting this, me on the right, and that's one of our volunteers on the left um, in uh, a stream collecting a sample. So as I said that there's certain macroinvertebrates that are, they're very good indicators of good water quality. Um, we're going to break that down into three different groups. Um, so this is our group one uh, macroinvertebrates. That includes the water penny larva, the caddisfly larva, mayfly nymph, stonefly nymph, dobson fly, riffle beetles, and guild snails. These are our pollution intolerant um, species. These are the guys that you're not going to see in pol any polluted waters. They need very high quality streams, um, with a lot of dissolved oxygen to survive. So they're very, these are your very good indicators. Going into your group two, these are semi-tolerant. And by semi-tolerant to pollution, what I mean is they can handle a little bit more pollution. These guys you can find commonly in ponds and lakes that still have good water quality, but may not be of the highest water quality. Um, these are your species like crane flies, uh, beetle larva, scud sow bugs, dragonfly and damselfly nymphs, uh, your freshwater mussels or clams, and your crayfish. And then our group three is your pollution tolerant. These guys you can find, midge larva you can find sometimes in septic water. Um, some of these other guys you can find in ditches along the side of the road where you may not have the best quality water. Um, like the that includes the midge, leeches, black fly, larva, aquatic worms, and our pouch snails. So touching on that, as you can see, this is a breakdown of our assessment forms that we use when we go out and, and do our stream quality monitoring. And you can see that group one, group two, and group three. And um, in each group, if you can see on the bottom of it, you can see the like number of tax and then you'll see times three in that group one. That means that they're weighted differently depending on which um, 
group that you're that you're finding. So water pennies and mayflies and stoneflies, they're going to be worth more points when you're completing an assessment form than your group two, or is your group two is only worth two points for everything you find, and your group three is worth one point. So what we do is when we collect these samples is we go through, we identify what we have, we get a total number, and we add up all those scores for each one of those groups, and that'll give you what we call the cumulative index value or our score for our site. So as you can see here, like you have A, B, A, C, B, the letter codes just mean how many individuals we found. So A means that there was under 10 ind individuals. Um, B means over 10, but under 100. And then C is anything that's over 100. So if you found over 100 caddisflies, that would give you a C rating. So that's just touching on the assessment form that we use. So going into once we collect a sample, and we take everything out of the net and we put it in a bin. This is kind of what you see. You see there's just a little mixture of everything. There's a lot of small stuff. There's a lot of big stuff. And we'll go and ask our volunteers, you know, what what are these? You know, start going through and identifying these. And if you've never actually seen the macroinvertebrates and you attend a workshop for the first time and we say, OK, you got to go through and figure out what all this stuff is. This is the reaction we kind of get. It's just a look of confusion and wait I have to go through and identify this stuff and fear not because you can keep that macroinvertebrate ID very simple um, looking at different um, like how many tails something has or the the gills on them or just the shape or color you can tell what the what the macroinvertebrate is without having to be very complex and you know we just got to keep it simple. So we're going to go into the identification now. So these two are always confused with one another. Even with our volunteers, sometimes they struggle with going through and, and identifying the two of these. Um, on the left here, you have the stonefly nymph, and on the right, you have the mayfly nymph. Um, so with the stoneflies, they have two hair-like tails. It's not, not the best identification feature because if you come across a mayfly that maybe lost one of his tails, they'll also have two tails. So if they have two tails, the next thing you want to look at is when you look at the back of their abdomen, um, you can see in the picture on the right, you see what looks like little feathers coming off of the backside of the mayfly nymph. Those are actually his gills. Uh, stoneflies do not have those gills along the back of their abdomen, um, whereas they are present on the mayfly. Um, another one of the features is Stoneflies are very active even in the net and in the water. Um, if you put, if you open the net up, that stonefly you see all the way on the left, that gold colored one, the common stoneflies, they don't stick around. They kind of just tear off out of the net. Um, they're very fast runners and they don't like to stick around. Whereas the mayflies are very s slow moving in the net. They may kind of flop about, but they don't really crawl or go anywhere. Um, but when you put them in the water, they kind of just tear off and they're very good swimmers. So kind of co I covered the three hair like tails. Um, like I said with the mayflies, they have gills lining their abdomen and they're very good swimmers. So let's see here. Why did that go backwards? OK, so going into the caddis fly, this is one of the hardest to identify for even our volunteers because there's so many different types and variants the caddis flies, um, but there is an easy way to identify them, and it's probably the most common larva that we see in our samples. So the caddisflies, they always kind of move like a caterpillar in the net. They're real slow, slow crawling, but they move just like a cat, like a, a butterfly caterpillar would. Um, the next thing you want to look for, and you can see in the pictures that each one of their heads and those plates they have kind of behind their heads are different colored than the rest of their body. Um, when you first glance them in the net, you'll see what looks like like a, it'll you'll just notice that different coloration um, that's key when looking at these as opposed to like some of the things we'll cover later like the beetle larva um, that's a key identification feature even if it's for different species you may have one that has an orange head and a yellow body or a brown head and a green body or or, or vice versa so also they're very slow moving in both the net and in the water um, 
they do make cases which sometimes you may see them in their cases but for the most part when you do disturb the substrate when you're collecting your sample those caddis flies will drift into the net and they will not have their cases on them but we'll cover those cases a little bit later so this guy is the dobson fly he's our big fierce predator that we have in the macroinvertebrate world um he's the guy on the left is the larva and on the on the right is the adult so the top picture of the adult is a female she actually retains her mouth parts as an adult and can still bite whereas the male which is really kind of intimidating looking grows his mouth parts into these two long horns which they use for fighting off other males and breeding um when trying to identify the dobson fly in water it's very difficult to misidentify one of these they're they can get up to like four or five inches long they're very scary most people open the net and they'll go look at it and they'll go oh no i'm not touching that thing and they are very creepy looking they have these false appendages or these appendages that go down the back of their abdomen they look like spikes um really don't know what they're used for they do have gill tufts underneath those and they don't know if they're for protection or if they're just used to make themselves look a little bit more intimidating to a predator um, i'm not really sure what they're used for so so going into covering this the adult riffle beetle and larva um in the pictures here the riffle beetle looks big that couldn't be more wrong they're very tiny i mean i'm talking the size of the tip of a pencil whereas when you open a net you may have hundreds of them in there and not even know they're there just because they're so small um you got to look very closely they're very slow moving but if you if once you catch one in your eye you'll start to notice that they're just kind of everywhere they're only aquatic beetle that we look at uh, both the adults and the larva are fully aquatic they don't emerge as um as like your other fly larva would and become terrestrial they're just they stay underwater their whole lives um the riffle beetle larva is always usually missed when we're doing our assessment forms just because they they're very small and they look like a lot of the other things that you'll see such as midge and even like a small caddis fly the best way to tell the difference between them is in that top picture on the right you can see that little white tuft at the back end of the riffle beetle larva that's actually his gill tuft and they can pull that gill in and then they can retract it and then stick it back out and it actually looks like a little beacon you'll see that little white flash on the back of them if you put them in the water and it's um one of the key identification features when you're looking at the riffle beetle larva hey ryan, um, ryan yes we have a question uh somebody wrote in and said do these bugs bite humans asking for my son okay so some of the bugs do have the potential of biting uh the dobson fly larva it can bite, um, especially, but there are ways you can hold some of them without having to worry about getting bit. Uh, with the Dobson fly, if you grab them behind the head, and actually here, let's see if I can, I don't know if I can go back here. Okay, so you'll see right behind the head on the Dobson fly on the left, they have that, like right where their front legs are. It's almost like a plate. And if you grab them there, they actually can't bite you. So you can grab them out of the net and move them into a container. Um, another thing, if you just let them crawl on you without actually being aggressive towards them and grabbing them, they actually won't bite you. They just kind of just crawl all over the place. Um, another thing that doesn't necessarily bite you but can hurt you is a crayfish. They have claws and they can pinch you. Um, so there is ways you also want to hold them behind their head on that plate with two fingers. And you just keep your hand away from their claws so that you're not at risk of of getting bit or pinched by one um there are other bugs that you can find in the stream such as giant water bugs and some of your diving beetles that can bite um that usually isn't like extremely painful they may you may just get like a pinch um but as long as you just grab whatever you grab as long as you don't grab them by their head you're you're not going to get bit so hopefully that answers that question um so one of the last things with the riffle beetle adult 
is there are different beetles that you'll see that you'll get along streams that maybe live in the vegetation or are floating on the surface of the water that that may not belong in the water but fell in the water. Um, to tell the difference between those, a terrestrial beetle and an, a, and a riffle beetle, is if you drop a riffle beetle adult in the water, it will sink. It'll sink to the bottom, it'll crawl around on the bottom, whereas a terrestrial beetle that doesn't belong, when you drop it on the surface, it'll float. So let's go on here to, okay, so covering the snails. So the snails are, they can be challenging to ID just because the way to ID them is the opening of the shell. So as you can see in these pictures, if you take the tip of the snail shell and you face it upwards and you turn the snail so that the opening is facing you, if the opening is on the right hand side, it is the gilled snail. If the opening is on the left hand side, that's the pouch snail. So the gilled snail is our intolerant species, whereas a pouch snail is a pollution tolerant species. The reason that is, is the gilled snail has gills and they breathe underwater. Whereas your pouch snails, they actually are, they can be slightly terrestrial, whereas they'll travel to the surf water surface. They'll breathe, they'll trap oxygen in their shell and then they'll go back down where they can breathe that oxygen in their lungs. So they can stay underwater for a good amount of time, but they're not truly fully aquatic. Um, one of the best ways to remember that that opening on the right as opposed to the left is I always say the opening on the right is right the opening on the left is wrong so right and wrong is the way to kind of remember that so covering the damselfly and dragonfly probably one of the coolest critters that you'll find in the stream um with the with the damselfly uh you think damsel in distress they're very you know they're very frail, they appear very fragile, they have long spindly legs and these just really thin long bodies and with these very fragile tail parts that they have. Um, you can kind of see those will look like a paddle on the end of their abdomen. Those are actually their gills. So their gills are on the end of their abdomen, whereas the dragonfly has internal gills. Um, damselflies, they kind of just crawl around on the net and they're also very slow moving in the water. Um, with the dragonflies, dragonflies, a lot of people say they kind of look like a tick or like an underwater spider. And I can kind of see that with the dragonfly nymph that I have there on the right hand side is it kind of looks like a like a spider. Um, they lack the external gills. They don't have the gills on the back of their abdomen like the damselfly. Um, they have internal gills, which we'll cover later on because they have a really cool adaptation that makes them special. Um, and they can swim pretty good in the water as well. So this is just trying to cover, I'm not cover, really covering the adults as much in this, but just to kind of give you a general idea of the difference between a damselfly adult and a dragonfly adult is generally the damselfly on the left there, they have, they'll put their wings together and they'll put their wings straight back over their abdomen. Um, there are different types of damselflies that don't necessarily do this, but for the most part, most of the species of damselflies you'll see will have their wings together and straight back over the abdomen. Whereas the dragonfly on the right, they keep their wings apart and they're out to the side. They say they have broad wings. They put their wings out almost flat, whereas the damselflies are vertical. And we have another question. Um, okay. What part of the food chain are these bugs in? So depending on the species, some of the bugs may be the lowest on the food chain. Um, the, got, the macrovertebrates that are the lowest, they'll eat algae, they can eat um, detritus or the different leafy material that's on the bottom of the stream. Some of them eat vegetation, whereas some may do both. Some may be scavengers and they may eat they may eat dead stuff. They may eat um, a little bit of vegetation and then you get like the Dobson fly larva. Um, some of your like your dragonfly and your damselflies are all predators. Um, the Dobson fly is probably the, the biggest, baddest macrovertebrate that you have that'll eat just about anything. Um, dragonflies are a close second where they can actually eat small fish and 
actually eat um, a lot of the other macroinvertebrates that you see, but it just depends on the species. And going off of that, um, we had another question that came in saying or asking, what's the best way to catch damselflies and dragonflies? So if you're trying to catch the adults, the best way to do it is if you're very slow moving and you have like a butterfly net, or a really fine mesh net, you can actually catch them using the net. Um, dragonflies are very fast. They have a compound eye that can help them see all around them. So you may think you're sneaking up on them and that they don't see you, but there's a pretty good chance they see you and they're just they're just biding their time to take off. Um, so they, they can be challenging to catch and you want to be fragile with them because their wings, if you do break a wing on one, if you if you happen to grab one, it you can basically eventually end up killing them because they can't grow their wings back as adults. Um, if you're trying to catch the larva, best place to, to catch them is in aquatic vegetation. Um, if you take a net, you go along the side of a pond, you can actually use the net and scoop along the vegetation, and there's a good chance that you'll catch some of the, the dragonfly and damselfly nymphs. Thanks. Okay, so covering the crane fly. I don't know if you've ever seen the adult crane fly actually looks like a giant mosquito. They're pretty common like around lights at night. Um, that is not a mosquito. It's actually a crane fly. Um, and this is the crane fly larva all the way here on the left. Um, the adult is completely harmless and so is the larva. Uh, there are a couple of the different larvas that look like the crane fly. They're very good that are grub like that you may mistaken. Uh, for a crane fly, if you see them in the net, such as like in our assessments, we don't cover the snipe fly larva or the horse fly larva, but we do frequently see them. Uh, the best way to tell them apart is a crane fly has a rounded head, whereas the other two have pointy heads. Um, the crane fly also, I don't know if you can see on the right side of that crane fly, it has like these little fleshy appendages that come off the back. Um, the only other thing that has like appendages that come off the back is the snipe fly larva and they actually look like two tails when you see them in the net um whereas the horse flies just pointed on both ends um same thing with the deer fly larva they're very similar to the horse fly larva as well so that's how you tell those guys apart beetle larva uh they could be very difficult to tell apart um the things you want to look for is like they're just lacking different features or the coloration. So the whirligig beetle larva the, is the larva for the we call the whirligig beetle, which is a little beetle. If you go down the stream, they, they swim in big groups and when you get close to them, they kind of they kind of whirl all over the place and dive under and that's the whirligig beetle. The larva actually is predaceous. It looks kind of like a Dobson fly, but it's a lot smaller, a lot shorter and slender and they have a spotted body. It almost look like a like a leopard, like they have a leopard pattern on it. And you can see that in the picture. Uh, they do have the little spikes that come off the side, um, but these guys are very good swimmers in the water as opposed to the Dobson fly that just kind of crawls around. Um, your scavenger beetle in the middle looks, once again, looks like a Dobson fly larva, but they're a lot fatter. Um, they're shorty and they're short and stubby and they lack those lateral appendages that come off the side of their body, like the Dobson fly and the whirligig beetle larva. Um, and then we did cover the, the riffle beetle larva. It doesn't really look like either of the other two. Um, like I said, it has that white gill tuft on the back. Hey, Ryan. Um, yes. Bug Boy asked, are any of these water bugs invasive? Um, there are different invasive species. It just depends really on, on the bug. Um, most of these macroinvertebrates that you can see can be found actually worldwide. You can actually um, replicate our SQM samples across the United States. So some of the macroinvertebrates that you see in Ohio, you can find in California or in Mexico or in Canada, um, and it can be replicated throughout the, basically throughout the world. Um, there are different types of invasive, uh, such as crayfish. There are different invasive species of crayfish that may be um, native to one part of the United States, but do not belong um, in Ohio, such as like the, the rusty crayfish. Um, 
but it really just depends on the species. There are so many different species. There may be like with um, with diptera or the true fly. If you go into that um, order, there may be thousands of different species of bugs that are in there and there could be invasive species, but I don't know off the top of my head like of some of what they may be, what the invasive species might be in that category, so. Okay, and um, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask one more question sure. uh, before you get started again. Uh, we had a viewer say, we've been doing a lot of creaking lately, which is awesome. Um, she says, she or he says, we wonder if there's a list of healthy streams. How do we know we are going on a polluted one? Um, we've seen some with the insects depicted here. It, it really just depends. Um, like I said, when covering earlier, the covering, the checking for water quality, you there may be um, different pollution that you can find in some streams as opposed to others. And if the, the best way to tell is by looking at what's in the stream. If you go in a stream and you're not finding anything, um, it's safe to say that there, there could be pollution. Um, it could just be you know, lack of oxygen. It could be the time of year, depending on what flows are that that the there's just not a lot of of macroinvertebrates present. Um, but the the safest thing is just to be aware of of if there are if it is a local stream, just checking with the township or checking with um, you could check with Ohio EPA and see what their studies show to see if it is a safe stream. Um, for the most part. Every it's streams are safe to be waded in. I would not drink the water even out of a high quality stream. You don't want to be drinking water out of the stream just because there are there is different things like Giardia and different types of E. coli that you can come across because there are start still animals that poop in the stream and you don't want to be drinking water that an animal has been pooping in and stuff like that. So um, you just have to try to be aware and of locally whatever stream you're going in. Um, what's in that stream and um, if you are finding a lot of these macroinvertebrates when you do your creaking that you're you're probably safe to continue to creak in that stream. Okay, thanks. So these guys here um, on the left you have the scud and on the right you have the sow bug. Uh, the scud, um, these guys can be found in usually around like woody debris and aquatic vegetation in the water. Uh, they look like a, they actually look like a little freshwater shrimp or, a, or what looks like a flea that you'd find on the back of a, a dog that had fleas. Um, they're really cool because if you put them in the water, they don't swim up and down like everything else does is they swim on their sides. Um, scuds also have the nickname side swimmers and the, it's for good reason when you put them in the water and you see them swimming sideways, it's, just, it's really cool to see them swimming around. Weird, but cool. Um, on the right, you have the, the sow bug or the sow bug. Um, it's basically our aquatic roly poly bug or potato or pill bug that you would find flipping over rocks and logs. Um, they look just like that, but aquatic. They have longer antenna. They have legs the length of their body, um, as you can see here in this one. So then there's the crayfish. So. Probably one of the easiest things to identify. Looks like a freshwater lobster or a small lobster. They have two big claws. Um, they're pretty frequent in just about any stream you can go in. Oh, there's a lot of different types of species of these. Some are small, some are big. Actually, there's people that go out and collect these to eat these. Um, they are considered a delicacy down in the southern United States and um, probably a few restaurants here in Ohio, you may be able to get crayfish. Um, so that's the crayfish there. Um, they're easy to catch. You can catch them in nets. They swim backwards. Uh, probably the best way to grab them in this picture, you can see right behind his claws, like where his tail starts to go up, you can see um, where his back is. That's where you want to pinch them, is behind the claws, um, above the tail, behind the head, basically. They can put their claws up but they can't reach their claws backwards to pinch you. So if you grab them by the back of their body, they can't reach back and get you. 
Um, if you do grab them by the tail, they can flip their body up and reach and reach forward and get you. So you want to be careful if you try to grab them by the tail. You want to grab them by the back. So freshwater clams. So these guys can range anywhere from the size of the end of the tip of a pencil to bigger than your hand, as you can see in that muscle that's on the right hand side. Um, they can get to be a couple pounds. Um, there's a lot of different species of mussels in Ohio, and they're probably one of the fastest um, declining um, organisms that we have in the state of Ohio. Um, that's thus the reason why it is illegal in Ohio to possess live or dead mussels, including their shells. So when you go out to the stream and you find the shells, as much as you want to collect them, it is illegal to possess them. So you want to make sure that you leave those in the stream. So now we're going into our, our group three individuals. So we're covering the black fly larva. Uh, black fly larva, they're very small. They're very, very, very small. A lot of times when you're using that fine net, they'll actually go through the mesh of the net because they are small. Um, when we collect our samples, we put a shower curtain underneath the net. That way, if we do come across like black fly larva or midge larva and they go through the net, they usually find them on that shower curtain underneath. Um, black fly, it has a big butt. It has a it's a it has a bulbous back end and a bulbous head end with a really narrow midsection. As you can see that one on the left hand side, it's it's really prevalent. Um, and one of the other things is they'll kind of just curl back and sh back and forth in this C shape. So when you put them in the water, if you see them on the net, if you kind of irritate them, they'll just kind of wiggle back and forth into a C both directions. Um, like I said, they're very small. They're easily missed. You got to look really carefully um, when you're trying to find these guys. Going on to the midge. Um, midge I touched on, they can live, some of them can live in septic water. Uh, they can be a range of different colors from yellow to black to brown to green to like this blood midge that's on here. It's just, it's just a solid red. Um, they kind of look like a small aquatic worm. They're a lot shorter than aquatic worm, um, but they're a lot more frantic. Like an aquatic worm's real slow moving, kind of wiggles back and forth, but the midge are just, they, when you touch them, they kind of go crazy and they flail all kinds of different directions. Um, and to tell them the difference between these guys and the black fly is that they're a lot longer than the black fly and they don't have that, they're not, they don't have that bulbous shape or that, that big back end and that big head in like the, the black fly larva has. So covering aquatic worms, all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Um, the aquatic worms that we see are the aquatic worms like you have on the left hand side, which are very similar to red worms or earthworms, um, to different types of flatworms like the planaria there in the middle picture. And then all the way on the right to the parasitic, it's a horse hair worm. It actually looks like a piece of hair until you touch it and it starts moving. Um, they're kind of really gross. But uh, they're pretty easy to identify. Aquatic, all the worms are pretty long bodied, um, except for the flatworm. The only thing that you can confuse the flatworm for is maybe a leech. Um, when you're trying to tell the difference between a flatworm and a leech is you look for those little, those little eye spots that you see on the flatworm. Um, the leeches will not have that. And also when you put a flatworm in the water, they sink to the bottom and just kind of crawl around, whereas a leech can actually swim very well Almost, they almost look like a snake going through the water. So touching on leeches, like I said, they don't have that visible eye spot like the planarian, and they look ribbon-like or, or like a snake when they when they kind of move through the water. They're very good swimmers. Um, leeches are they can be parasitic. There's actually more uh, species of leeches that are not parasitic that actually feed on other organisms like fish and. They can be a variety of different sizes. Um, we do have parasitic leeches in Ohio, so it isn't completely uncommon if you're wading through like silty areas or vegetated areas, if you're fishing or you're creaking, if you're there for an extended period of time, you may get a leech on you. Um, you won't even know they're there. They don't hurt. You can pull them right off of you. So thankfully the leeches, aquatic leeches we have in Ohio are, are not very big. 
So now that we covered the ID, we're going to get to the, the fun stuff. So we're going to look at what makes these bugs super powered. Now, I don't see too many bugs like this one here in the picture, this Hulk stone fly going around, but there are different bugs that have different abilities that we could consider being super powered if they were in people per se. So first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at super strength. Uh, first thing that comes to mind is the stonefly nymph. And the reason we say super strength is because how many people you know of can just sit on a rock like that and it just and just knock out that many push-ups. And a stonefly, what well, if you catch them and put them in a tub of water, a lot of times you'll see them doing this and they'll just do push-ups and push-ups and they'll do hundreds of push-ups and you think, man, you know, that stonefly is actually trying to get big and buff like this. And that is not the case at all. What the stonefly is actually doing is he's, when he's doing those push-ups, is he's forcing water over his gills and he's trying to help pull that dissolved oxygen out of the water with his gills. So when he does those push-ups, he's actually he's actually forcing water movement over to help pull that oxygen out. So he's not doing those push-ups to try to get big and buff and strong. He's actually doing it to try to help him breathe. The next thing with super strength is the mayfly. Now, if you've ever seen an adult mayfly, they're the farthest thing from strong. They're very frail, they're very small, they're very fragile. But what makes the mayfly strong is not by one individual mayfly, it's strength in numbers. So in this picture here, actually just uh, northwest of Sandusky on Lake Erie, you see what looks like this rainstorm or could even be a snowstorm coming in. And that is not rain or snow that's being picked up on the radar, but actually mayflies. So up in areas along Lake Erie, you may get a mayfly hatch where there's this many individuals that can actually, you know, completely block visibility that could coat cars and to the point where you actually have to have plow trucks come out and plow them off the road. They're so thick on the roadways. And the strength with the mayfly is, is that because they're such a small frail species, they're targeted by a lot of predators like bats and birds and, and fish love them. Um, so in order for them to succeed and be able to continue on with, with, with breeding and having future generations, they have this strength in numbers where they have these mass emergences where they all emerge at once. And with the thought process, you can't eat us all. So all these mayflies, they only live for a few hours to maybe a few days. They breed, lay eggs, and die. And then you have what looks like this picture here on the right where you just have mayflies just coating everything. So kind of pretty crazy to see. And some of the people that may live along Lake Erie have, have may seen this before. So going on to our next um, superpower, is invisibility. Now, when I say invisibility, I'm not talking that you one second you see it and then the se next second it's gone and it's just, it's still there, but it's completely invisible, but more so an active camouflage. So one species that does this well is the caddisfly larva. Now the caddisfly larva isn't actually invisible itself, but what it does is it creates this case, as you can see on the left, this caddisfly is in this case made out of small stones. Um, different species of caddisflies can make cases out of just about anything they find in the stream, from stones to sticks and twigs to leaves. And they use that to try to help them, not only for protection, that they have something they can hide in, but also keep some camouflage to the bottom of the stream so that predators may not see them and mistaken them for just being a stick and just kind of swim off instead of eating them. This caddisfly here, you can see he's used just about everything, including even has algae growing amongst the the, the twigs and, and branches he has on him. And if you were to see that in the stream, he'd be almost invisible. It'd be almost impossible to find them, but catching him in the net and then putting him in a white tub, you can actually see him a little bit better. Um, if people have taken advantage of caddisflies and have actually been able 
to manipulate them to creating jewelry, such as if you took a caddis fly and you put them in a container loaded with gold flakes and different gems, the caddis fly actually takes a silk, almost like a spider web, and they basically anchor these cases together and they can use whatever they can find to help them create these cases for protection, such as this jeweler that actually takes this caddis fly and uses them to create these cases. And then once the caddis fly moves on from his case, they take the case and they can turn it into earrings or a pendant on a necklace. So kind of pretty fascinating, actually. Going into the next thing for invisibility is the water penny larva. And you can see this water penny sitting on a leaf. And if it wasn't zoomed in on this water penny, you probably wouldn't even notice that he's there. And actually, if you look really carefully on the water penny, you may actually see the little mayfly that's also camouflaged on top of them. That even when I put this PowerPoint together, I didn't even notice until later on. I was like, oh, hey, there's two bugs in this picture. But the one thing the water penny can do is it can and it has a flat body and what it does is it anchors itself to the rock so you can actually see the um the water penny unless you look really closely or you rub the bottom of the rock and they come off of the rock and they're just so small and and they're like a coppery brown color and they blend in with their environment so well So going on to the next guy is a guy that oh, we don't necessarily. Hey yes. Question. Somebody wrote in and said, can you make inferences about the fish population within a river based on what bugs you catch using simple nets? So um, with everything with the food chain, if the macroinvertebrates are a very important role in the ecosystem because they provide food for small fish and so forth. So when you have when you have the macroinvertebrates present, you're most likely going to have your smaller fish species. You'll have different types of darters and minnows and so forth. And then as you go up, you know, as you if you have bigger bugs and in bigger fish, then you have bass and, and bluegills and you can go so forth, muskies and you know the, you have a balance with the food chain. So it's, it's important to have macroinvertebrates in the stream because if you don't have the presence of macroinvertebrates, you do not have that food source to provide to fish and you'll start to see your fish species disappearing um, okay. and then so forth. And so. They, they asked such as how they uh, had a clarifying follow-up question. So such as how high the fish population is. So you, could you make a, a guesstimate on how high the fish population is then if you have a healthy variety of, of macroinvertebrates? Um, not necessarily. Um, it, it really depends on water quality when you're looking at fish. There's there's mm -hmm. different indicators for um, for different streams because you have you have cold water streams, you have warm water streams. So you have different species that live in those streams depending on the temperature of the water, the quality of the water. Whereas you may have, you could have a pond that's loaded with dragonfly nymphs and damselfly nymphs and so many different bugs, but there could also be no fish in that pond. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily mean like by looking at the macroinvertebrates, you can actually tell the populations and the quality of the of the fish that are there. Okay. Hopefully Thanks. that helps out. So, um, covering the water scorpion, it's not something that we look for in our assessments, but it is something that sometimes we get in our nets if we're sampling near vegetation. Um, as far as active camo looks, if you look at it, it actually looks like a like a walking stick. As you can see, he's just this long twig-like looking bug. Um, they hang out by the surface of the water. They have these, these forearms that are very much like a praying mantis. They reach out and they grab fish or other bugs that may swim by. Um, they're predaceous and one of the cool things, not only do they look invisible in the water, if you actually go up like along the edges of the ponds and look really careful, you may actually see these. But one of the really cool adaptations that the water scorpion has is not only camouflage, but they have this long snorkel like tail and the snorkel is actually two 
crescent shaped um, half tubes that looks like two tails. But what they can do is when they they put those that those two tubes together to create a snorkel and they stick that tail out of the out of the water so that they can breathe and remain underwater. So they actually have a breathing tube coming out of their butt and going above the water, which is kind of different, but also a cool adaptation that helps them stay underwater and be able to hunt prey while also being able to breathe oxygen. So jet propulsion. When you think of superpowers, you think, you know, flying or being able to run fast, but when you think jet propulsion, it's like, well, that. how is that a superpower? Well, with the dragonfly, it is a superpower. So the dragonfly nymph has this ability to pull water into its abdomen and push that water out using its its gills in in short bursts to create this jet like propulsion. So they basically kind of fart their way through the water. And as you can see here with this dragonfly in this in this bowl, he's actually not even moving his legs. He's literally just shooting water out of his abdomen and it just allows him to just jet around in this bowl of water. So a really cool adaptation the dragonfly has and it helps them swim. It also helps them be able to shoot forward to get closer to prey and be able to be more effective hunters. And that's not the only thing the dragonfly can do. So one thing that a dragonfly and also it's um, the closely related damselfly nymph can do is it can it has an extendable jaw call, called a labium. And that extendable jaw actually they can shoot out from underneath their body forward and grab their prey. So if a fish is swimming by, they can shoot that jaw out and actually grab their target prey. As you can see here, you can see that jaw come unhinged and go forward and grab this, what looks like a little um, mosquito larva here in the water and pull it forward to its mouth part. So just really cool feature that the dragon flying damselfly have. So going into here is the health regeneration. So to start with health regeneration is you have the, the crayfish. As you can see, the crayfish here on the right hand side, he's lost a claw. Um, they lose claws to predators that try to grab them, like a blue heron trying to grab them, or a fish may come down and try to bite them, and they may lose a claw. They may lose legs in fights. Uh, crayfish are very territorial, and they may, they may rip each other's limbs off. Uh, crayfish can grow back their legs and claws. It does take a little bit of time for them to regenerate over a couple of molts. So after the crayfish molts its exoskeleton and, and, and that skeleton hardens, after a few molts, they can have their claws back and be able to completely function again. So if we had this ability as people, can you imagine losing fingers or losing a foot or something like that and being able to grow those fingers back or being able to grow your foot back would be extremely useful. And the one thing that does health regeneration the best is the planarian or the planaria. Um, this flatworm has a really unique ability that if you were to cut a flatworm into multiple pieces, that flatworm, the pieces of the flatworm would literally grow back into new individuals. So the head, if you cut the head off, the head would grow a new body. If you cut the midsection, the midsection would actually grow a new tail and head. And if you cut the tail off, the tail would actually grow a new head. It's a really cool ability they have. Um, I don't know if you can see this link down here on the bottom. That's actually a video to PBS Digital Studios. They actually show the, the planaria being cut apart and they show that regeneration of the planaria. Also here, so this is day seven after a planaria has been cut into pieces. You can see the cut ends and you can see it's starting to grow its eye spots back and starting to get a new head. And after 12 days, this planaria has a new head, he has a new tail and has already new eyes as well. So very cool that the fact that this planaria can 
completely regenerate its body. And no matter how many times you cut it, it'll just grow back and you'll have a new individual as well. A really cool feature that the planaria has. So going into a new superpower, X-ray vision. Now, that's not quite what we have. We don't have X-ray vision or bugs being able to see through walls or be able to see your skeleton. But we do have one that has a pretty cool feature, and that's the Whirligig Beetle. So the Whirligig Beetle cannot shoot lasers out of its eyes or use X-ray vision, but what it can do is it can see above the surface of the water and below the surface of the water at the same time. So it can actually, if you see a whirligig beetle, they hunt on the surface of the water. They can watch above them to make sure that they're safe from predators while also watching below them to hunt for prey. It's a really, could they have a compound eye? And as you can see here, and to get a closer look, you can really see that, that top eye and the bottom eye there that allows them to be able to effectively see above and below the water. So after covering a lot of the different superpowers some of the bugs have to talk about that these macroinvertebrates have also inspired um, comic book characters. So the Dobson fly larva that you have here on the left is also known as a Helgramite. And in DC comics, there's a character that's called the Helgramite. It's a comic book villain, as you can see here on the right hand side, that fights characters like Batman and Superman. So that macroverts have actually inspired, you know, comic book writers to create characters based off of their aquatic larva. So uh, probably pretty cool. Um, so after covering all the macroinvertebrates, we do have available resources to try to help with the macroinvertebrate ID that we've put together through the Scenic Rivers program, including the macroinvertebrate cheat sheet and the dichotomous key. So the cheat sheet is act, everything that was covered in the PowerPoint here is covered in this cheat sheet as much as, so the, the how many tails the mayfly has all the way down to um, showing the size of the riffle beetle. It's all covered in the cheat sheet as well as like the dichotomous key. If you find a bug in the stream, you can actually go through the dichotomous key and break down to figure out what it is that you're looking at. So if you are interested in any of these, um, these handouts, we have these in PDF form that we can send over. Just contact any of our Scenic River managers or uh, Scenic River coordinators or SQM coordinators, and they can get these over to you. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Ryan. Yes. Um, Kbugger97 wants to know, what is your favorite insect? My favorite insect is probably a close tie between a dragonfly and the giant stonefly. It's if if we're talking Ohio streams or we're talking aquatic insects, those are probably my favorite. But if we're talking just insects in general, my favorite, my favorite insect is probably a tarantula. I personally have own tarantulas and I, I just love I love seeing them. They're really neat and they're just a cool critter. I know a lot of people don't like spiders, but I've always been kind of a, a spider freak. So <laughs> thanks for the question to our uh, from our viewer too. I always like those questions. Those are fun. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> so another thing we have is the Ohio Scenic Rivers Activity Book. Um, Alyssa, I believe, shared this in the chat. So I'll share it right now, actually. OK, so if you guys want to get a, uh, a hold of the digital copy of this, you can. Um, we do have hard copies of this, but it was a very limited print, so we don't have a whole lot of prints to give out at this time um, until we do another printing. Um, but I don't know if you can see me very well, but here is our activity book. The activity book is very good for kids. It has coloring pages and it also has different types of activities illustrating different macroinvertebrates such as the caddis fly showing, you know, there's a coloring page as well as connect the lines and different, there may be crossword puzzles, word searches, all kinds of different activities in this book. Um, 
to help your kid learn about, you know, some of the ha habitat and some of the different bugs that live in our streams. And then this is we have a webinar next um, next Thursday on August 27th um, called Wel Welcome to the Riparian Zone. Uh, Matthew Smith, who's actually a producer on this, is going to be covering this as long as well as our uh, manager for Northwest Ohio, Christina Cookley, will be covering um, why rivers need trees. So the importance of having trees as habitat and you know what those trees provide for the river. Awesome. Um, so we have a couple more questions, Ryan, and then we're going to. Uh, I think that was, was that the end of your slideshow? Yes. OK. Um, yeah, a couple questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Claire asked, do uh, I hope I say this right? Will it will a gig? Did I say that right? Will yes. gig beetles bite? Um. I've never noticed a whirligig beetle biting. I've handled them plenty of times and I've never been bit. I don't know if they they just don't have the ability to bite people. Um, they are predacious towards other bugs so they can bite other bugs, but every time I've handled them, they've I've never been bit. I don't think they can bite people. Um, one of the cool things with a whirligig beetle too is if you do handle one, um, they do secrete like a uh, like a fluid that smells almost like those cherries you get in the jars. I'm probably going to butcher this word. I think they're called maraschino or maraschino cherries. Mm -hmm. um, you would get on like an ice cream cone. So it's kind of a weird thing to come across or kind of a weird thing to say too, to tell people, oh yeah, this bug smells like cherries, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we had a question a little bit earlier in the program and, and Christine, answered it in the chat, but I just wanted to ask it again because it was a great question and in case people didn't see it. Um, we had a viewer say, uh, are there any opportunities for kids to go on insect hunting trips with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources? Um, and Christine mentioned that we do public programming um, to take you creaking in a scenic river, but the programs are on hold this year. Um, and, and Christine shared her email in the chat. So if anybody is interested in doing that once the programs get running again, um, feel free to, to give Christine um, a shout and let her know and she'll connect you with the appropriate coordinator for your region. Um, and I think that that was, since we asked questions throughout, really, I think that that was the bulk of the questions. Um, oh, and, and Claire asks, is there a way to last week's webinar? And yes, thank you, Claire, for asking. Um, I did want to share our YouTube page and um, that webinar was actually just posted today. So Ryan, I guess I'll take you off the hot seat now and, and put myself up here since I'm talking, but <laughs> all right. Um, but yes, I will publish that in the chat right now, the YouTube page, or excuse me, in the Q&A. And um, if, you, if you want to, you can also go to our YouTube page and or go to YouTube and just search Ohio DNR and you'll always be able to find those videos. So the last two are there now. Um, and you know, it's not, it's not wanting to let me share that link with you. So let me try one more time, guys. But thank you for, for joining us today. As um, Ryan mentioned, next week's webinar. Uh, can Christine or Matthew, could one of you try sharing the YouTube link in the chat? For some reason, it's, it's not allowing me to. Um, but if you do see, if anybody sees Bob's question in the Q&A, I did send Bob the YouTube link, so you might be able to find it there. Sorry about that, guys. Um, but anyways, next week we also have um, our last episode of She's a Force of Nature, if anyone is interested in that. Um, we will have Jen Bushheit from the uh, from Old Woman Creek National Estuary and Research Reserve, and um, 
Natalie Purview from our Division of Parks and Watercraft, and Natalie oversees programs such as um, the Clean Marinas program and our Trails program. So two awesome ladies that we're going to be highlighting their careers with ODNR. This last, this, um, this week, actually just yesterday, we did one with Michelle Comer from the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. She's a um, district manager for Ohio. And um, there's just so many different awesome ladies that, that we highlighted. The other one this week was Laura Kearns, who's a wildlife biologist. So that'll be also on our YouTube page um, if anybody wants to watch. So thanks for joining. Thank you, Ryan, Christine, and Matthew for all your help today. This was awesome. And I hope you have a, a great weekend, everyone. A great week and weekend. <laughs> all right, thank you.